Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. So good to see you all here. You survived the storm. That's nice. The church got a little damaged, as you might have noticed. Uh, the steeple is down. Uh, some of the siding also. And, um, well, obviously, we'll take care of that. Um, so thank you for braving the um, one hour less sleep. I'm just curious to see how many will show up at 10.30. We'll see that. Um, and uh, if you're like me, I'm missing that one hour. But do not worry, I have prepared a nice long sermon for you. Take a nice nap. <laughs> I have a couple of people who need to give announcements, so let us call on Carlin first. Good morning, church family. Good morning. It's good to see you today, as always. You are all wonderfully generous people. Our recent air conditioning project proved that when you donated the funds in record time. And I suspect that in the near future there might be a steeple project <laughs> after the storm. But today I want to talk to you briefly about another giving opportunity, the Nativity Church Mission Endowment Fund. This fund was created when Pastor Christian Wee was leading the congregation as a way to support worthwhile religious, charitable, and educational ministries that are not regularly budgeted by our church. Most recently, the fund contributed to the purchase of accessories to help our bell choir, which you may have noticed in the past. Unlike the Trumpeter Endowment Fund, which is a closed fund, you can contribute to the Nativity Mission Endowment by donating cash or stocks and bonds, real estate, or making memorial gifts or bequests designated to the fund. Jill and I regularly contribute to the fund by making memorial gifts to it. If you wish to take advantage of this opportunity, just uh, refer to the brochure that hopefully you picked up today or received when you came in. And if you have any questions about it, you can talk to me or the other members of the committee, which are this year Tim Cotter, Suzanne Shelf, Mike Davis, and Bonnie Keister. God blesses us when we are generous. We have a generous God. Thank you. Well, my name is Susan Millie, and I'm the uh, co-leader co of the Days for Girls Nativity chapter. And I came to come to you for an opportunity um, to have a, a, send aid to the girls and women of the Ukraine. This effort is really, really close to my heart. A really dear friend of mine up in Michigan immigrated here from the Ukraine about, I don't know, 20 years ago. Um, and his family is still in Kiev. Since February 24th, I've been praying for the people of Ukraine and saying to God, okay, help me out here. I need a sign, what can I do? So, on Wednesday evening, I came to church for the uh, Lenten service to find the Ukrainian flag standing next to our flag. I was touched. I'm sorry. I took a picture and I forwarded it to Vladimir and I said, I, I can't think of anything else to do. We're praying and remembering you. Godspeed. I got no response, but that's typical at this point in time. He's got other things to worry about. Thursday morning, as we cleaned up after the Days for Girls work session, Jill Helgeson came over and showed me an email that she received from the Days for Girls. Um, and the email explained that Days for Girls was requesting assistance to send some type of hybridized kits for the women that have been displaced due to the war. One of the groups, our group is unable to provide components for the kit. Um, what, but what I'm asking is for cash donations because that will provide the ability to buy disposable 
hygiene products, um, pay for boxes and tape for shipping, pallets, um, that kind of stuff, and the actual shipping cost itself. I'm asking that you please contribute whatever you can, and I can't imagine how these women feel laying in a cold, dark bomb shelter in Kiev or in a train station in Poland, nowhere else to go, wrapped in a blanket on the floor, trying to take care of your kids, your mother, your aunt, your uncle, and then starting your menstrual cycle with no supplies. Having a hybrid kit would provide the girls or women dignity and the knowledge that someone in the world cares. Please use our beloved little green envelopes <laughs> and make your checks out to the Women of Nativity, or WON. Put that in the memo. Or if you do cash, just write on the outside, cash for um, Women of Nativity. God answered my prayers. I can, through Days for Girls, do something for the Ukrainian people. I would love to be able to text Vladdy and tell him what Nativity accomplished today in their donations to help the women and girls of the Ukraine. God bless you. I hope everything turns out okay for the Ukrainians. And thank you to my Nativity family. Let us um, worship with our whole heart, with all our energy, with our mind, with our body. Uh, we sit in prayer in a moment, uh, for a moment yet. Uh, listen to the prelude. Let us turn towards our living God. And then we worship also with our um, singing and with our prayers.
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Hear my voice, O Lord, when I call. Have mercy on me and answer me. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of the covenant, in the mystery of the cross, you promise everlasting life to the world. Gather all peoples into your arms and shelter us with your mercy that we may rejoice in the life we share in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. One day 
eyes that are blind will see you clearly one day all who deny will finally believe one day hearts made of stone will break in pieces and one day chains once unbroken letter to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, join, me in join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory. 
by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. The word of the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the Though an an army encamped against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise up against me, my trust will not be shaken. That very hour some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills its prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. 
And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Foxes get a bad rap. They're known as sneaky liars and always end up on the loose inside in morality fables told to children. They're actually one of nature's smartest animals. Foxes are extremely caring parents, and while they might be most closely related to dogs and canines, foxes are much more like cats. For instance, foxes are almost entirely solitary, like a cat. For the most part, foxes try to avoid running into other foxes. But most foxes live with other foxes in their own family. Another way, they are like cats. They have whiskers, and not just on their faces. Foxes also have whiskers on their tail to help them with direction. And did you know that a red fox can hear your watch ticking 40 miles away? So if you see a fox in your backyard, don't even think about getting close to her. In today's gospel, Jesus calls Herod Antipas a fox. After hearing from some Pharisees that the king wants to kill him. It's not easy to understand the Pharisees' motivation in warning Jesus. Pharisees are often just opposed against Jesus and his work. In some places, they are presented as clearly hostile or trying to trap Jesus, and he pronounces woes against them in the fifth chapter of Luke. But on other occasions, they seem pretty uh, friendly. They offer hospitality, and Jesus goes and has meals with them. So is this a friendly warning prompted by concern for his well-being or an attempt to disrupt his activities for some reason? On the one hand, when they suggest to Jesus that Herod desires to kill him, their claim could read as a trick to scare Jesus out of town. On the other hand, even though Herod is curious about the miracle maker, he has no problem imprisoning and executing outspoken prophets like John the Baptist. So is this information we get from the Pharisees, misinformation or manipulation that they are engaged in? News broadcasts are always tainted by a certain ideological perspective, all of them, no matter how neutral they want to be and say they are. A good practice is to expose oneself to multiple news outlets and then form one's own opinion, keeping in mind that even one's opinion is still a product of one's upbringing, worldview, education, political leaning. Manipulation happens when one is exposed to just one way of seeing reality and when all other sources of information are silenced. This surely happens in authoritarian regimes as it may happen by choice even in a democratic country where people choose to listen to limited information sources reflecting one's own ideological sphere. This is when lies become the tool of choice to confuse the conversation, to spread misinformation, and to control outcome. Obviously, this behavior hampers communication understanding, and trust. 
This is when people stop talking with each other and start shouting, if not shooting, at each other. Regardless of the trustworthiness of the Pharisees, Jesus sends them back with a message. Tell that fox that I answer to a higher authority, Jesus seems to be saying. Foxes in both Greek and rabbinic literature were depicted as crafty, sinister creatures. This is no compliment to Herod. Jesus refused to be turned from the cause he is committed to and the course he intends to pursue to bring it about. Jesus' response covers two distinct dimensions. He will not be scared off by a threat of present danger from what he is doing here and now in Galilee, and he will not be deterred by the threat of future danger from continuing on to Jerusalem to do what he intends to do there. Prophets have been threatened before with death, punishment, and indeed, they have died. You may remember passages in Jeremiah. You may remember Samuel rejecting Saul in the first book of Samuel. Nathan rebuking David in the second book of Samuel. Elijah challenging Ahab in the first book of Kings. The prophet's job is to tell hard truths we do not want to hear. The prophet will not receive applause and acclaim. The opposite is true. The prophet will be denied and at best ignored, at worst maligned and persecuted. Prophecy is a job not for the comfortable, but for the afflicted, not a calling for the certain, but for those burdened by the suffering of their communities. But it isn't just the powerful who are the objects of the prophet's criticism. Prophets also name our acts of injustice, and we push back because we don't want to hear that. We raise our defense mechanism and reject their words as untrue and inflammatory. We counterattack, point a finger at others, project onto others our own sins, and seek ways to justify ourselves missing the opportunity to take responsibility and grow. But as it turns out, such rejections do not get the last word. Truth always prevails, even as it may be muffled in the short run. We should be lucky to acknowledge quickly that their words are not condemn condemnation, but the reconciliation God offers, God's yearning that we would return to God's embrace. Jesus knows that he will incur death if he goes to Jerusalem. Nevertheless, this is what he, set, he has set his face to do. And he will not stop until it's finished. Christian historian Diana Butler Bass reminds us that Jesus lived, breathed, and embodied a boundary subverting inclusion. Nothing is excluded except excluding. This is hard to take in. Jesus' table fellowship, calling one and all around the table of communion and friendship with God and one another, prefigures the great wedding party to which we will all one day participate. Jesus remembers that the devil had left him in the desert with the intention of returning eventually at the opportune time 
and try again to distract and dissuade him from his mission. In the desert, Jesus' identity, loyalty to God, and mission were questioned and threatened. He is aware and lets his followers know that staying the course is surely going to take him and them into a head collision with the powers of evil, which will eventually inflict the pain of death. Jesus has had a taste of that strong rejection when he first announced his message in his own hometown, and his own people were ready to push him off the cliff. But again and again, Jesus' prayer life has sustained his resolve to seek the kingdom above all. Such is his desire to be found faithful to the will of God and honor his calling. He counts on the providential assistance of the Father who will give him and those who ask all that they need. His desire for the well-being of Jerusalem and all of Israel will require sacrifice. On one hand, Jesus recognizes the evil that Jerusalem has inflicted on past prophets. Jerusalem does not desire, desire what he desires. One doesn't have to be a parent to mourn missed opportunities, broken promises, or crushed hopes. All of us, regardless of our circumstances, know what it feels like to have our advice rejected. We know what it looks like to fail in our best efforts to protect those we love. We know the grief we experience when we watch someone we care self-destruct before our very eyes. On the other hand, Jesus is not calling for the destruction of Jerusalem. Certainly not everyone in Jerusalem and not all Jews were opposed to Jesus and his message. Hence, there would be some that would eventually exclaim the words of Psalm 118, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is not talking of all the Jews as in a block. He is generalizing for sure, but he is not that blind. He is deeply lamenting the historical record of those who strove to eradicate the prophetic voice that critiqued their power and challenged their authority. He has in mind those who, in their self-righteousness and unwillingness to see, lack openness to the vision and ways of God. Jesus is experiencing grief, but he will not retreat in the face of the people's stubbornness and opposition. For the sake of the city, he must pursue a course that eventually will bring him to the cross. He ac accepts that outcome for himself and cannot prevent it for his followers. How can a disciple save his or her life apart from Jesus and his way? But he expresses his sorrow. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you were not willing. Now, pay attention to what he just did. Jesus introduces a feminine image for God. A hen gathering her chicks under her wings. 
Now, can you stay with that picture? Can you see what Jesus is describing? Our God, a mother hen. A mother hen whose chicks reject her. It's hard enough not to think of God as a male and father. After all, this picture has been imprinted on our mind and we've been stuck with it after so many years and so many sermons. We're used to it. We have absorbed that image as a realistic description of what God looks like. But if we are shocked, it's only because we have limited our understanding of who God is. We have painted that image in our mind and are stuck on it. But it would be better, it would better serve us if we learned to pay attention to the many other female metaphors in the Bible to describe God's power, acumen, or meaningful relationship to people. Take, for instance, the following images. God as enraged she-bear in Hosea. God as soaring mother eagle in Deuteronomy. God as laboring mother in Isaiah. God as mom of a healthy, happy toddler in Psalm 131. God as skilled midwife in Psalm 22. And on this second Sunday in Lent, Luke's Gospel invites us to contemplate Jesus as a mother hen whose chicks do not want her. Though she stands with her wings wide open, offering welcome, belonging, and shelter, her children refuse to come home to her. Her wings, her arms, are empty. This, in other words, is a mother bereft, a mother in mourning and struggling with failure and futility. Jesus calls Herod a fox, but we need not to be fooled. A fox can be dangerous. While in the world, the believers are not necessarily immune to harm. On the contrary, we run into it. A hen is there ready to protect her chicks, but not all will survive the danger. Those who don't make it have chosen not to take shelter. But even those who are covered by the hen's wings are under physical and emotional threat. Jesus' plan isn't about the comfort or safety of his people in this world. The kingdom is not for the faint of heart. It's risky, dangerous, painful, costly. As we renounce to self-serving interests, as we surrender to the way of Christ, as we deny our life and bear our cross, we give up the pleasure, comfort, and security that the world offers to embrace the pleasure of knowing Jesus and be known by him. We coddle the comfort that God's promises offer us, and we rest safe and secure in his arms. At the same time, this kind of prophetic life is disturbing to the world, and we may feel the full force of the world's rejection. Jesus, the mother hen, spreads his wings wide open with his heart totally exposed ready to offer shade and shelter for all his children, even the ones who want to stone and kill him. The image of chicks snuggling under a mother's hen's wings 
is an image of gathering, of community, of intentional oneness. It requires a return, a surrender. What in us is not willing to be gathered this length? Maybe a powerful Father God may give us assurance, a sense of firmness and power. And yet today Jesus suggests that a yearning mother hen is the God we belong to. She is the one weeping for us and calling us home. And the home she is calling us to is profoundly communal. The reach of her wing is wide. The hospitality of her shelter is vast. Her body and her heart are on the line, and yet her desire is fixed on us, on all of us. May the longing of Jesus become our longing too. May the way of the mother hen the way of vulnerability, sorrow, hope, and readiness to welcome, lead us home. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy One, we confess we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own way. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us, forgive us, and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow you. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you, and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again and gathers you under wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen.
us profess now our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born in the Virgin Mary, suffered and conscious God, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the Church, the world, and all who are in need. Dear God, you gather the church into a community of mercy and grace. Unify Christians around the globe in efforts to proclaim good news, even in the face of opposition. Merciful God, Creator God, you made the entire universe and called it good. Hinder those who would cause destruction to our planet's fragile ecosystems and augment the calls of those who advocate for thoughtful stewardship of the Earth's resources. Merciful God, God of all nations, raise up leaders committed to love and justice. Nurture in those who govern humility and patience to receive criticism openness to new ideas and the courage to change course when needed for the sake of the common good. Merciful God, faithful God, you hear us when we cry to you. Attend to those expecting a child and console those who have experienced miscarriage. Comfort veterans enduring post-traumatic stress Shield those endangered by domestic violence. Uphold those who are ill or grieving. Console and protect all in crisis as Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues. Comfort and guide those who suffer in the wake of deadly U.S. tornadoes. And thank you for sparing this holy house. Comfort the people of Peshawar, Pakistan, as they mourn those killed during the bombing of a mosque in their city. Guide the United Methodist Church as it grapples with divisions. Comfort and guide those wrestling with long COVID, COVID researchers and all those preparing now for the rise of future variants. Comfort those who are unsafe in their own homes and protect those without a home. We praise you, O God, with gratitude for the first combined heart and thymus transplant, for all advances in the field of organ transplantation, and for all organ donors. Merciful God, God of our future hope, you kindle faith that moves us into action. Guide children and adults preparing for baptism or confirmation. Empower Sunday school teachers, confirmation leaders, and parents who share their faith with younger generations. Give us all a renewed sense of vocation. Merciful God. Eternal Lord, you welcome us into your heavenly realm. We give thanks for those whose labors on earth are ended and who now rest with you, including Barry Simons and Kaylin Fay. On the final day, gather all of us with them in your loving arms. Merciful God. Accept the prayers we bring, O oh God, on behalf of a world in need for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us offer each other a sign of God's peace.
Let us pray. Extravagant God, you have blessed us with the fullness of creation. Now we gather at your feast, where you offer us the food that satisfies. Take and use what we offer here. Come among us and feed us with the body and blood of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, to our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <clears throat> he was betrayed our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body given for you do this for the remembrance of me again after supper he took the cup Give thanks and give it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray the prayer Christ himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. Here is food and drink for the journey. Take and be filled. Christ given for you. 
please join me in consuming the elements. body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Blessed Jesus, in this rich meal of grace, you have fed us with your body, the bread of life. Now send us forth to bear your life-giving hope to a world in need. Amen. You are children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, motherly, majestic, and mighty, bless you this day and always. Amen. Amen. People of Nativity, what is our mission? With the birth of Jesus in our hearts, we carry light and love to the world. 
Go in peace. Jesus meets you on the way. Thank you.